Well, I want to say hello and welcome to all of you who are watching online today. Welcome. We're glad you're joining us. And to any of those who are connected with our Crossing Church family located in St. John's and Gander, Newfoundland and Labrador, special welcome to you. We're glad you're joining us today. Also, it's Father's Day weekend, so I want to do a shout out and say Happy Father's Day to all the dads who may be watching online today. And especially, I want to say Happy Father's Day and I love you, Dad, to my own dad, who I know will be watching this as well. We're in week three of our message series on Ruth. And it is a story of compassionate loyalty with a thread of God's invisible hand at work in the tragic circumstances of the lives of Naomi, an Israelite woman who, along with her husband Elimelech, we heard and read in chapter one, and their two sons had to leave Bethlehem because of a famine, and they settled in Moab. We learned that the two sons marry Moabite women. One is Ruth, of course, and the other is Orpah. We are not told what happened, but all three women find themselves widowed and without protection or provision as a result. And even more tragic, no heir to carry on Elimelech's family line. In chapter one, there was this emotionally charged moment when Naomi, having heard that the famine is over in Bethlehem, decided to return to her home. And though Ruth and Orpah, they started out with her on the journey, at some point, Naomi releases her daughters-in-law to go back and to marry Moabite men, that they would have a better hope in doing that than staying with her. While Orpah decided to do as Naomi wished, Ruth refused to go and insisted that she stay with Naomi and go with her into an unknown country, adopt her people and her God as her very own. Naomi returned to Bethlehem empty, and she told her friends to change her name to Mara because indeed she was bitter, and she felt that God had raised his hand against her. Now remember in chapter 2, there were so many it just so happened moments. It just so happened that they returned to Bethlehem as the barley and the wheat harvest was beginning. Ruth went out to glean with the harvesters, behind the harvesters, excuse me, and just so happened to find herself where? In Boaz's field. And Boaz just so happened to drop by the field and noticed Ruth, and he offered her his protection. And he insisted that she remain in his fields gleaning with his workers. And he even invited her to share a meal with him and his workers. And it just so happened, of course, we discover that Boaz is a relative of Elimelech. So the plot was thickening. We left off last week in chapter 2 with Ruth settled into her mother-in-law's home. And she gleaned in the fields with Boaz's women until the barley and the wheat harvest were done. So today, we're going to take a look at chapter 3 in this continuing story. If you have your Bibles with you, you can op open them now to Ruth chapter 3. Now, we don't know how much time had passed, but we do know that the harvest was over, and it was barley winnowing time. Now, some say that during this time, Naomi was expecting Boaz to make a move to do more than just allow Ruth to glean in his fields, but to have the relationship grow and indeed leading to marriage. But it seemed that things were not progressing at the speed or in the way that Naomi had hoped. And we're not given any explanation as to Boaz's seeming hesitation. Uh, perhaps we'll get more of a clue as we get into this chapter. So we're going to cover the entire chapter, Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. So let's pray first. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful story of loyal uh, compassionate love. And God, I just pray that you would open our hearts and minds now because you always speak through your word. We pray for your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, ears, and hearts to what you want to tell us and teach us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so let's get started here. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be provided for. It is Naomi now who will move the storyline along in this chapter. And she lets Ruth know that she'd treat her as if she were her own daughter, securing for her a permanent home where she could find rest and the security that she needed. Perhaps Naomi was thinking of what would happen to Ruth once she died, leaving her even more destitute 
if she was without a husband. So Naomi was about to hatch a plan. And one scholar notes that in response to a providentially given opportunity, Naomi began to answer her own prayer. Yahweh acts in Naomi's acts. Her acts execute God's plans. Let's go on to verse 2. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he'll be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Naomi repeated what she had shared back in chapter 2, that Boaz was a relative. In fact, he was identified before as a close relative, the relative Elimelech of Elimelech, Naomi's dead husband. But this would be the basis for the plan that Naomi was about to hatch. His kinship and the duties that went with it were indeed the key. She apparently knew Boaz's schedule, that he was going to be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. And for those who may not be familiar with the winnowing process, I'll just give you a Coles note lesson here. Scholars say that harvested grain was first bundled in the field and carried to the threshing floor, which was an open space on a hilltop with exposed bed, bedrock or really hard earth. The grain was first threshed or trampled under animal hooves or crushed under cartwheels to remove the husks from the kernels. And winnowing separated the kernels from the husks and then chaff and stalks. So the winnower repeatedly tossed this mixture into the breeze and the wind scattered the lighter chaff away, leaving the heavier grain to fall to the ground. And some say Boaz chose to do his winnowing at night because the night breezes were better than the gusty winds of the day. What Naomi instructed Ruth to do was risky. Let's continue. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. Naomi instructed Ruth to bathe and put on perfume and her best clothes. What is Naomi up to? It seemed that Naomi wanted Ruth to make herself as attractive as possible to Boaz, but some note that these instructions were Naomi's way of telling Ruth that she needed to change out of her garments of mourning and put on clothes that signaled that she was ready to get on with her life, ready to be remarried. She was to go to the threshing floor and remain incognito until Boaz finished having his meal. Naomi knew that after he ate and drank, he likely would be in good spirits. And Naomi continued her very specific instructions. Ruth was to watch where Boaz laid down to sleep, since there may be others there. She needed to be careful to note where he was so she didn't approach the wrong man since it was pitch dark. After he was asleep, she was to uncover his feet and lie down. As scholars note, it was well known that the term for feet could be used as a euphemism for sexual organs, but most agree this was not the way it was used here. The term feet meant the place where his feet lay, and most believe that she was just to uncover his lower limbs. So it was known that at winnowing time, the men would sleep next to their piles of grain so no one could steal it, and prostitutes would come to the threshing floor to offer their services. This was not the behavior that Naomi would ever suggest that Ruth take part in. Ruth's actions were signals to Boaz. Some say by laying at his feet, she was signaling that she wanted his protection. But others think she was signaling a marriage proposal. Naomi then told Ruth that after she did these things, to wait, and that Boaz would tell her what to do. Naomi was counting on Boaz's noble character that he wouldn't take unfair sexual advantage of her. This plan was a risky one. I think you're kind of getting the picture here. One author notes, Naomi asked Ruth to enter an uncertain, compromising situation with a great deal hanging in the balance. This mysterious secret plan of Naomi's had Ruth's best interests at heart. 
She was counting on Boaz's character and integrity to interpret Ruth's actions appropriately. And what was Ruth's response to Naomi's plan? Well, it was one of full compliance. She didn't ask questions or raise any concerns about the plan. She would do what Naomi asked of her, despite the dangers, again, showing her loyal devotion to her mother-in-law. Let's continue. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was, in good, and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He, re he turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So Boaz, after having his meal, was in good spirits, and he laid down by his grain pile, and he fell asleep. And then Ruth made her move. She snuck up on Boaz and carefully uncovered his feet or his lower limbs and laid down and waited. How would Boaz respond when he stirred and found her there? And we've just read something startled him. Most don't think he was afraid, but that he shivered from the chill from his legs being uncovered, and he rolled over. He was quickly shaken from his drowsy demeanor when he found a woman lying at his feet. The audience would have been on the edge of their seats, wondering how he would respond to this unknown woman and this very compromising situation. The silence was broken when he asked her, who are you? And she identified herself as his servant, Ruth. Then Ruth went off script from Naomi's instructions, you'll notice, and instructed Boaz to spread the corner of his garment over her. And this literally, literally meant to spread one's wings over. Some say this was a marriage custom where a man symbolically took a wife by throwing a garment co corner over her, also symbolizing the protection of her. And you remember back in chapter 2 when Boaz prayed the blessing upon Ruth that, that Ruth would find protection and refuge under the Lord's wings? Well, in essence, Ruth was asking Boaz, to answer his own prayer. She wanted Boaz to take her under his wing and offer her security. And to Ruth, Boaz should marry her because of his family connection. Once again, Ruth is showing her Hesed loyalty and kindness toward Naomi. By invoking the kinsman redeemer custom, this would mean the possibility of providing Naomi with an heir. Continuing Elimelech's line, but she was also showing tremendous courage by making the demands that she was making of Boaz as a woman and as a foreigner and as a person who was poor. And what was Boaz's response? Instead of sending her away, he blessed her. It seemed he was pleased or maybe even flattered by her marriage proposal. He told her that her acts of hesed, her display of loyalty and devotion, were praiseworthy because she, of her own free will, held up family obligation over her own happiness. This, again, was an example of Ruth's self-giving devotion toward Naomi. Boaz pointed out she could have chosen to marry a younger man for love or money, but she chose family loyalty instead. And he, again, referred to her as my daughter a term of endearment, and told her not to be afraid, but that he would do what she had asked. He would marry her. 
and Ruth's reputation as being noble in character was such that he felt no one would object, and in fact, they would accept Ruth as one of their own. Well, it seemed everything was settled, right? You just think, well, we could just end the story there, at that verse, but wait, suddenly, there's a complication. There's someone who's a closer relative who had the right to serve as the kinsman redeemer. And so the author created a moment of suspense in this story. Boaz's respect for the Israelite customs and willingness to honor them showed the audience once again that he was an upright man. One scholar says that this additional obstacle highlighted the invisible hand of God at work behind the scenes. All of a sudden, the marriage of Ruth to Boaz might be lost. But if they did get married, the audience would know for certain it was by the hand of Yahweh. Boaz told Ruth to stay there for the rest of the night. You see, the middle of the night certainly was no time for a woman to be traveling. And so again, Boaz was protecting her from harm. Let's go on. So she lay at his feet until morning but got up before anyone could be recognized, and he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. And when she did, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her, and then he went back to town. So Ruth did as Boaz instructed her, and she laid down at his feet, and then in the morning she got up in the pre-dawn darkness so she wouldn't be noticed protecting her from the serious repercussions of being found out. Her reputation depended on an unnoticed exit. And Boaz filled her shawl, shawl with barley. Why did he do this? Some say this barley was intended for Naomi, but others speculate that Ruth carrying this heavy load of barley might explain, should anyone see her leaving, why she was there, that she had worked overtime in order to stave off poverty and hunger. Let's finish up verse 16. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? And then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. One can only imagine the night that Naomi put in, wondering what was happening with Ruth and her encounter with Boaz on the threshing floor. She immediately looked for a status report on the night's events. Was she Boaz's wife? Did her scheme succeed? Ruth reported the night's events, all that Boaz had done for her, his commitment to marry her, and if not to him, then to the closer relative. And she presented Naomi with the large bag of barley given to her by Boaz, this was a signal to Naomi that Boaz was committed to helping her. This was also significant because Naomi, in chapter 1, returned to Bethlehem bitter and empty. Boaz's gift signaled that there would be a change in her fortunes. Naomi told Ruth to sit tight and see what happens, certain that Boaz would settle the matter right away. God always blesses the reading of his word. So the curtain falls on chapter 3, and the stage is set. As one scholar says, all the characters have played their roles perfectly. Naomi took the initiative and hatched the plan. Ruth loyally and courageously followed her daring scheme, and Boaz responded just how Naomi had hoped, as a man with character and integrity. In a seemingly impossible situation, where misinterpretation of Ruth's actions would be understandable. Boaz knew her intentions were not what others might expect, expect. And once again, the invisible hand of God is at work in ways that the audience would know that if there was a positive outcome of this visit, it was part of God's plan. God was at work in this risky behavior, in this risky, excuse me, endeavor. This chapter got me asking, what was it that happened to Naomi's attitude that allowed her to hatch such a risky plan and have some confidence that it would work? It was a plan that on the surface really was doomed to fail. 
But one pastor noted that it was what she came to know and to believe about God that moved her to act and to take the risk. Naomi experienced God's compassionate loyalty and kindness, or hesed, back in chapter 2. She came to understand that during those it-just-so-happened moments, God's invisible hand was working out his plan to save her. She trusted that God was sovereign, and he actually was not against her, as she had charged him back in chapter 1, but that he was for her and that he was good. Out of this understanding came the courage and the hope that Naomi needed to lay out this very risky plan and to put Ruth in a potentially compromising position. But out of this, trusting in God's invisible hand at work and the fact that he is good and wanted to rescue these two most vulnerable women, Naomi was able to act, trusting he would work things out for their best. Naomi was hopeful, and that godly hope and confidence moved her to take a risk. It moved her to action. So this made me think about how important it is that we understand who God is so that we can step out in faith and take risks for Jesus, courageously partnering with him as he works out his plan in this world. So here's my question today. How do you see God? How do you see God? How do I? You know, if we think that God is against us, that he's out to get us, the way that Naomi thought back in chapter 1, um, how does that affect how we live? Well, I think we'd be like Naomi and have our names changed to Mara, and we'd be pretty bitter, especially during times of struggle and loss. We'd be trying to please God by keeping the rules, trying to gain his love and acceptance by what we do. And I think that we would be fearful to act. I think we'd be paralyzed because we'd be afraid of what might happen if we took risks that God may be calling us to, and therefore we'd miss those opportunities that God is placing before us. And one scholar says this, believers are not to wait passively for an event to happen. Rather, they must seize the initiative when opportunity presents itself. You know, we're only able to do this if we see God for who he really is, that he is sovereign, that he is at work in all of our circumstances, and he is compassionate and showed us his loyal love when he sent Jesus. You see, we needed a redeemer. We needed someone to rescue us from our dire circumstances and our deadly condition that has separated us from God. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8 Paul talks about God's timing and our hopeless condition and what Jesus did for us in order to change it. Paul writes, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us at just the right time. God sent Jesus, our Redeemer, and he paid the price. As one author says, as our great Redeemer, the Father displays his great authority in a plan that cannot be thwarted, conquers evil, and exhibits a faithfulness that gives confidence for eternal life with him confidence for eternal life, but confidence for a life lived um, partnering with him on mission. God's plan cannot be thwarted. His love is unlimited. And when we believe this, we'll have the courage to step out and do things that are outside of our comfort zone, knowing that he is at work and that he is calling us and that he is good. So what risk is God calling you to take today to move his plan forward in your life? What is he showing you through your circumstances or your situations that he is at work and he's inviting you to join him? Is it a change in your career? Is it a move to a new place? Is it forgiveness offered to someone because of a broken relationship? That's risky. 
Is it speaking up in situations that need a hero? Is it developing friendships with others who don't look like you? I just think of the climate that we are in now, and I believe that God is calling us to take risks. Is it sharing with a coworker that you're a follower of Jesus? And as followers of Jesus, we aren't to be passive. We aren't just people who sit by and, and live peaceful lives. We are to seek peace and pursue it. We aren't just people who long for justice and mercy to be shown in our world. We are to actively seek ways to be involved in the cause and to seek ways to get involved. We aren't just to say we love others. I mean, I can sit from my armchair and say, well, I love others. But we are called to act out that love. That's the type of love that God shows us. Real love is action. Real love is a verb. And we could courageously risk our own comfort. And then we could sacrificially, um, for the sake of others, love them. When we know that God loves us, and when we believe that he is for us, and that he is at work in and through us, we will be compelled to join him. Knowing that when we are in God's will, there's actually no risk at all. In fact, it's the safest place to be. Let's pray. Father, help us today to see our circumstances um, that, that you are at work very much in our circumstances and we're in our situations that we find, that, God, indeed, you are sovereign and you are good. And so that will give us, God, the courage to step out and to take those risks in Jesus' name, those courageous moments that you want us to act, trusting that you're with us, trusting that you're at work, and trusting that you want to partner with us in your plan for the world. And so, Father, help us not to be passive. Help us to be very active in our community and beyond. Help us to be people who will speak out. Help us to be people who will get involved. Help us to be people who will be courageous, Lord, um, in your invitation for us to join you as you call us to seek justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you. That's our prayer today. Give us the courage we need, Lord. We thank you that the safest place to be is, is in your will, and therefore there's really no risk at all. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.